as you know, I'll be talking about gold. I think uh, you know some people get self-conscious that they don't have a, a room packed to the rafters with attendees, but actually, I don't mind that because it, you know if you have everybody already in the in the boat, so to speak, and everybody already owning a certain asset, whether it's gold or stocks or what have you, uh, that tends to be more of a, a signal that might be time to sell than buy. And I think that we're you know, the reason I bring that up is that I think we're in the early stages of what's likely to be a multi-year bull market in gold. And that's, um, you know, that's going to be the focus of this presentation and what those four forces are that are primarily driving this. So let's start a little bit by, again, sort of the top-down view, not just affecting gold, but where I see us in terms of the overall market and economic environment. Um, we've had this, this situation where over the past quarter century, we have multiple rounds of excessively easy monetary policy, right? Um, but unlike, I think, what what some were afraid of and what central bankers were kind of aiming for. We haven't seen so much real world inflation like we saw in the 1970s, but it's been more asset market inflation, right? You look at what's happened with the dot-com bubble, for example, that would be exhibit A, or exhibit B would be the housing bubble. Um, the money flowed, flowed into assets. And you know when those two bubbles burst, Americans lost in total $5 trillion in the dot-com bust and a much larger $16.4 trillion in the housing bust. And unfortunately, rather than kind of, you know, look at a new approach to policy making, a new way of thinking, basically policy, policymakers prescribe the same, you know, doses and on a much larger scale of the medicine that got the patient uh, sick in the first place and that led to these boom-bust cycles. So that's kind of how we got here. And I think, you know, you look at it from 2009 to early 2018, we experienced what I consider to be pretty much the biggest, broadest asset boom ever. And by that, I mean it didn't encompass just traditional assets, things like stocks or bonds, uh, but it also swept up housing, commercial real estate, and all kinds of esoteric assets that we don't follow or talk about a lot. But you can find plenty of evidence of this showing up in everything from rare art to baseball cards to antique jewelry and all these other uh, sort of sub-markets. But what's happening is that now that, that turn that we're looking for, that, that economic and credit cycle turn, that's starting to happen. You're seeing volatility start to rise. And you're seeing some of these asset markets start to leak air. So for investors, what does that mean predominantly? <laughs> You know, I, I think you have to be ready for a much more wild ride in the markets, and you want to buy gold. I happen to, you know, have, among other things, be an English major, and I, you know, I thought of this W. B. Yeats quote, the Irish poet: "The turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falconer cannot hear the falcon, falconer things fall apart, the center cannot hold." Um, that is sort of what I think we're heading towards in the markets, where this moment of volatility is increasing, risk is increasing, and uncertainty is increasing. And it just sort of leads to this market where you have to be protected. You have to be more defensive. And one of those primary asset classes is gold, precious metals. So what are the four primary forces? We'll go through them one by one and try and touch on them as much as possible. The first goes back to the cost of money, interest rates. You have falling interest rates again here in the US. You have deeply negative interest rates abroad. And that's fuel for gold for reasons I'll explain in a minute. You also have surging volatility, struggling stocks in the sense that the S&P 500 has basically gone nowhere for 21 months and counting, and you have a rising risk of recession. That's boosting demand for what I call chaos insurance. Third, and you know this sort of market of every asset or all you know these all these assets being overvalued, gold is essentially one of the few undervalued assets relative to many of the other investment choices you have. And finally, just on a pure supply-demand uh, basis, you see the fundamentals are really improving for gold. The data is showing that that's a better sort of, uh, sort of trade-off for you as an investor. So that's working in your favor as well. We'll start by talking about interest rates. Um, you know, we're barely out of zero land, frankly, when it comes to the interest rate markets. And you know, markets are already clamoring for cuts again. If you look at this period, we all know, I mean, not just in the US, but in the Euro area, in Japan, the UK, and so on, you had interest rates pegged at or below zero or just above it for a period of eight long years. And they only started here in the US raising interest rates in 2015. And it's been a pretty you know, stair-step process, but nowhere near what we saw in terms of magnitude at the top of the last cycle. And again, the markets are already clamoring for cuts. Uh, when I say the markets are clamoring for cuts, you don't need to look any further than the, the U.S. yield curve and the bond market to see this going on. Essentially, almost the entire Treasury yield curve is now trading below the upper end of the federal fund's target rate. So again, this black line here is the upper end of the federal fund's target rate. These different colored lines represent 2, 5, 10, and 30-year U.S. Treasuries. They're all, with the exception of the 30-year, and that's kind of right there, yielding less than the top end of the Fed funds rate. Um, why do I care so much about the yield curve beyond that I just happen to be an interest rate guy? It fascinates me. It doesn't make me the most exciting party guest, but you know, it is what it is. Um, that the yield curve is basically doing the same thing now in terms of it being the flattest and most inverted since we saw really before the last credit crisis in bear market. 
This chart shows the difference in yield between a three-month U.S. Treasury bill and a 10-year U.S. Treasury note. The higher up here that you are, the more or the wider that spread is in terms of 10 years being higher than three-month bills. And the further down we are, it's a case of three-month bill rates being higher than 10-year Treasury yields. And again, this chart goes all the way back to the late 1980s. What do you see? Four major flattening and inversion cycles here. Here in the late 80s, here in the late 1990s, here in the mid-2000s, and again here in the mid-2000 to late 2010s. What do those white bars represent? If you were in the debate presentation earlier, you know the answer. But essentially, those were the starts of the last three recessions that we had in this country. And you can see, after a significant flattening episode followed by inversion, we've had basically three for three recessions follow, which kind of gives you an idea of what I think is coming next here in this cycle. And what's noteworthy about this interest rate cycle is that it's kind of ending before it ever really got started. Uh, this chart has a lot of data on it, so I'll leave it up for just a little bit. And it basically looks at every single interest rate cycle we've had, um, hiking and then cutting cycle, going all the way back to the mid-1970s. You can see that, on average, uh, rates in the past were pegged at their lows for just over 11 months. On average, the hiking cycle took about 22 months. And on average, rates were raised 563 basis points, or 5.6 percentage points. What happened this time? Well, rates were pegged at the lows for 84 months in this cycle. The Fed dragged its feet in terms of how long it took to hike rates. It was basically three years. And we only got in 225 basis points of hiking during the good times. So that, left, that leaves us with less ammunition, basically, to combat a slowdown. So it, it's, it's kind of, from a cycle, from a sort, sort of historical standpoint, it's pretty noteworthy where we're at. <laughs> now, you know, I mentioned sort of the, the, the NERP, ZERP situation we have overseas, negative interest rate policy or zero interest rate policy. Um, this is a great chart from Bloomberg that basically shows the dollar value of negative yielding bonds globally. And you can see that that has been steadily rising up until about a month and a half ago. We we're essentially at $15 trillion in both government bonds and in some cases over in Europe and Japan and so on, corporate bonds yielding, yielding less than zero. Completely unprecedented. I mean, again, you're, you're getting paid to borrow money, essentially, is what this means. Uh, so really unprecedented. So that kind of gives you an idea of the interest rate side of this argument, why with all this stuff going on in the interest rate markets, it makes gold and silver and mining stocks relatively more attractive. Next, I would talk about the sort of the chaos insurance, the need for protection. Recession, volatility, and possibly a new bear market, they all seem to be heading our way based on my read of what's going on out there. Uh, if you might have seen the movie The Big Short, then you know what the scene is, talking about the mortgage bonds and how it kind of was going to collapse like a, a Jenga tower. Um, in this cycle, though, it's not what's happening in the mortgage or housing market that you really should be most concerned about. It's what's happening on the corporate debt side of the ledger. Last time it was consumers where all the sort of the nuttiness was going on. This time it's on corporate. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's start by talking about the absolute amount of debt. We've seen corporate debt outstanding between 2008 and 2018 go up about 82%, so almost double to $6.2 trillion. Um, and again, people will say, well, a lot of times debt increases as corporate, during an economic expansion. Corporations want to borrow more to sort of increase their, their potential revenue and earnings. And that's true to a degree. I mean, you did see, even in the last cycle, uh, debt did increase somewhat. But it's the slope and the amount that we're talking about that was really unprecedented in this run-up versus what we've seen in past economic expansions. And more importantly than just a pure sort of quantity of debt we're talking about, it's the quality, right? Um, it's not just how much debt's being thrown out there, it's how junky that debt is. And that's what this chart shows. If you go back about a decade ago, the investment grade universe of debt, whatever is considered investment grade, um, the lowest rated tier on that, you know, you, you probably know the, the scales that S&P and, and Moody's and so on use. The lowest rated scale of investment grade is triple B. And about a decade ago, that bonds in that category were about 35% or just over a third of the quote unquote investment grade market. Now it's essentially half. So when you look at how risky investment grade debt is, you have basically half of the bonds out there in the corporate world that are rated the absolute lowest tier. They're just sort of skating by. Uh, and that's not just true here in the US, it's true overseas. And that tells you that even quote unquote investment grade isn't really what it used to be. Uh, you might have heard the term leverage lending, leverage loans. The Fed's talked about it. It's been in the New York Times and so on. Essentially, it's a, it, a risky form of, of borrowing, typically to finance things like corporate takeovers and so on. The amount of this, this leverage lending going on has really been booming. You're talking about $1.2 trillion, give or take, of this debt that's kind of clogging up the system. Uh, this table goes back to April 2019. You can see how it's been steadily rising. Again, you can think of these as sort of a, a different kind of junky junk bond or junk financing, and a lot more of it's out there. Now, again, when you buy, you go to buy a stock, you know, one way of measuring how expensive it is is price-to-earnings ratio. Is it cheap, is it expensive, good or bad deal, and what have you. 
Uh, when, you have a, when you're a private company or a private equity buyer and you're trying to take over a company, one thing you're looking at is the price you're going to pay relative to the cash flow that company generates. The lower the multiple, the better a deal you're getting. The higher the multiple, the more relatively expensive you're paying, you know, the price you're paying is, and the more risk you're taking on that that company is not going to be able to perform. Um, you can see when it comes to takeovers, the, the multiple here to EBITDA, which is sort of core cash generation, was at about 11 times. Uh, that's absolutely unprecedented on deals that took place in 2017 and 2018. It's even higher than what we had just under 10 at sort of the peak of the last you know, nutty credit cycle. So in other words, a lot of this leverage financing is financing more and more expensive deals at higher and higher prices. Uh, are these companies going to have the cash flow to pay the, those loans back? Uh, that's the real risk. And to make a lot of these deals pencil out, essentially, there's these things they call add backs, adjustments to EBITDA, and you say, oh, well, we want to buy this tire maker or something, and in the next two years, we're going to cut jobs, we're going to move this factory here, and all this stuff that we think we're going to be able to do is theoretically going to make its cash flow better in the future, so let's bring all that back to the present and justify the price we're paying. Uh, adjustments. What you can see here is going all the way back to 1997, 43% of the transactions in the first half of 2019 had this sort of book cooking, if you want to be uh, less, you know, <laughs> less nice about it, or you know, forecasts of sort of, oh, we're going to do all this stuff and it's going to work out great. 43% uh, of the transactions had that. That's absolutely unprecedented. So not only are the prices high, the actual multiple to you know, cash generation is based on some really, really optimistic uh, number crunching. So again, it just increases the risk of these, this debt not, paying off, not being able to be paid back. Um, what I'd also point out is, you know, we all know about the corporate tax cuts that were, were passed and so on and how it led to a lot of, you know, extra money uh, in corporate, uh, in corporate kitty, so to speak. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of that money, instead of being spent on, you know, R&D or building more productive factories, investing in, you know, personnel and so on, a lot of that money was basically frittered away on financial engineering, stock buybacks, uh, takeovers, things like that. This chart shows the four quarter average of stock buybacks just for S&P 500 company, companies. You can see that footed to about just under $800 billion in the last four months, uh, or last four quarters, which is obviously unprecedented. The only time we came even close was at when the peak of the last credit bubble, what happened next, the market fell apart. So uh, really a historic, um, historic number there. And you know, more than a year ago, I was trying to think of a, a sort of a, a mainstream way of explaining all this stuff and sort of what, what's a good metaphor for what's going on. Um, and ironically enough, I thought of the book Yertle the Turtle. Now, this is a Dr. Seuss book that I actually really enjoyed as a kid, and I think that's why it popped into my head. And if you're not familiar with the story, Yertle's this you know, turtle just swimming around in the mud in the pond with all the rest of his buddies, and he decides he doesn't like the view anymore. He wants to get a better view. He wants to be able to see over the trees and, and you know, sort of be king of, of all he can survey. So he manages to convince all these other turtles to start stacking themselves on top of each other higher and higher so his view is better and better. He reaches this point where he's never satisfied. And finally, Mac, the guy at the bottom, says, to heck with this. I'm getting the short end of this. The whole thing comes crashing down. I use that metaphor because that's kind of what's happening in the corporate market. It's not just that the corporations, in terms of debt, are doing one risky thing. They're stacking risk on risk on risk on risk. You're make, you know, we have high-risk loans being made to high-risk companies, all those adjustments that I talked about, record percentages of that. Um, there's these other things called covenants, which are sort of restrictions on what corporations can do with the money. Uh, those are being way cut back, so basically they can have free reign. Um, and theoretically, there's nothing wrong with uh, taking on risky loan, making risky loans, whether you're a bank or a hedge fund or whatever, as long as you're getting paid for it. You need to bring enough money in the door to cover the inevitable defaults you're going to have. But the problem is you're earning record low spreads, record low rates on a lot of these things. So there isn't really that sort of, um, you know, that reserve being built up against what's going to happen to defaults. And you're originating record volumes of this stuff 10 years into this easy money cycle. So uh, again, that's kind of how I look at it. And what's noteworthy, and you might have caught this in the earlier presentation, what's noteworthy is that the credit market is starting to wise up to this. You know, we've had what, four attempts since January of 2018 of the S&P 500 to try and, you know, hit and hold a new high. They've tended to fail versus what happened prior to 2018. What's different? Look at the credit markets. This is a chart of the spread uh, for investment grade, oh, excuse me, for investment grade bonds. Basically, it just says, okay, if Treasury, if the government's borrowing at 2% for 10 years, how much does the average investment grade company have to pay? If it's 3%, then that's 3 minus 2, 1 percentage point, or 100 basis points. So that shows, basically, and if I had gone back further, you would have seen this was steadily going down. The amount corporations had to pay extra to borrow was steadily going down as the stock market was steadily going up. What's happened since 2018? 
Each of these sort of new highs for the S&P has not been confirmed by the credit markets. The cost of borrowing as a company relative to the cost the government pays is going up. Why is that happening? It means the credit markets are pricing in more risk behind the scenes. They're getting worried. Now, why would they be worried? Obviously, the debt issues I just talked about are very important, but it's also that the economic expansion is extremely long in the tooth. As of July, uh, it was a record 121 months and counting. Um, you know, we've never seen anything like that in the history of the United States. Even the late 1990s expansion, we just surpassed that. So that's when you see the worst excesses at the tail end of a credit and economic cycle. It's where you see most of the risk taken on, and it's what sets you up for an ultimate, you know, negative outlook for the markets. Uh, once that, you know, once you reach that stage of irrational exuberance of whatever term you want to use. Um, what's also noteworthy is this chart, which I briefly touched on. This just shows the New York Fed, has, the New York Fed itself has a recession probability um, model that it uses. And it looks at basically the difference of those interest rates I talked about before, three month versus a 10 year note. And the narrower and then the inverted that spread gets, the higher by their model, the percentage of recession in the next year gets as well. What's interesting is even in the depths of the worst, you know, sort of Volcker caused double digit interest rate recession that happened right around the start of the 1980s, this, the way it's mathematically constructed, it never hits 100%, right? But what's noteworthy is the level it's going to relative to history and the speed with which it's increasing. What do you see here? Uh, this spread has really, or this recession risk probability has really skyrocketed by this model. It's at about 38% as of September's data. Again, 38% may not sound, oh, it shouldn't it be 100, but it, mathematically it doesn't get there. You want to compare it to the past. That's higher than you had right before the, uh, the sort of Gulf War spike in oil and savings and loan crisis caused recession here. It's almost equal to what we had right before the housing market uh, and, and mortgage recession began. And it's closing in on where we were at the peak of the dot-com bubble and the recession associated with that. So again, even the Fed's own model is kind of pointing to this risk. Of course, there's the popular narrative that the Fed is going to save us from this by cutting rates and doing other things, QE and what have you. Um, but the Fed's track record is not good. I mean, you may not need me to tell you that, but if you go back to the last four cycles, including uh, this one, there was only really one bullish policy pivot where the Fed realized, oh, shoot, we're, you know, we hiked too much, we're going to cut. There was only one time where they essentially got it right early enough and magnitude was strong enough. And that was the 94 and 95 cycle. You may have heard the term the soft landing. That's what happened there. And then we had four or five more years of bull market. But the issue is here, these red bars show recession. The green lines here show the S&P 500. And this is the federal funds rate. What happened in you know, the dot-com situation here and what happened in the housing situation here? The Fed did, in fact, cut. It did realize it made an error. But it did it too late. And the magnitude wasn't enough to head it off. It was already baked in. Um, that's what I think we're seeing now in this cycle. You know, the Fed has gone too far. There's other things going on, whether it's trade and tariffs and so on. And essentially, even if the Fed starts cutting, which it's done, it's too late. It's too little too late would be the simple way of putting it. Um, so that's kind of what you look at in terms of interest rates. Now, obviously, there's other fiscal levers the government can pull. So it's not just the cost of money. It's, hey, can we give tax cuts? Can we, you know, launch some spending efforts, deficit spending and so on, uh, to sort of on the fiscal side head off recession? Well, there's one problem with that, and that's that we didn't rebuild Uncle Sam's balance sheet in the economic recovery, and other foreign economies didn't do the same thing either. Essentially, throughout the economy, usually what happens is governments spend a lot to head off recession in recession, and then as you know, the economy improves, it brings in more taxes, they, you know, the deficits come down, and so on in the economic expansion. But that didn't happen this time around. And it didn't just happen here, it happened globally. This shows global debt levels on this side in terms of trillions of dollars, and this is percentage of global GDP. You can see throughout this recovery, the amount of global debt has been soaring to the point where it's almost $245 trillion. And on a percentage of GDP, that's about 320%. So we have governments that are going to be more hamstrung in this downturn that's coming to offset it through fiscal efforts. That kind of gives you the economic argument for gold. And that, now let's move on to basically the cheapness. Is gold cheap? Is it expensive? I would argue, again, in an ocean of overvalued assets, gold does, in fact, look cheap. And we'll just touch on some of the other asset classes out there. Um, this is a chart of the S&P Case-Shiller, the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, CAPE in short. Without getting into all like the boring sort of math and the way it works, the idea is smooth out price to earnings over economic cycles and then look back and see um, you know, how we are today versus historically. And Robert Schiller is the Nobel Prize winning economist. Um, you may have heard of him. He was one of the guys to talk about the housing bust before it happened. And he's the one who came up with this. 
So in any event, this price to earnings ratio, this CAPE ratio is about 30.1 most recently, which you can see that's essentially where we were at the peak of the 1920s mania. And the only time in history it's been eclipsed going all the way back to the 1800s is at the peak of the dot-com bubble. So, you know, pretty significant valuation concerns there. Now, the other thing I think you would argue is that it's not just in the public markets where valuations are ridiculous. I mean, I always point to the sort of profitless dot-com echo situation we have going on in the tech industry. I mean, you know, Uber, we all know about Uber, Lyft, and the pr struggles and problems they've had post-IPO. I mean, that company went from a $5 million valuation to, to a theoretical or talked about $120 billion valuation without ever earning one single penny of operating profit in its entire 10, 11-year existence. You have companies like DoorDash, which, you know, we're not talking about revolutionary, uh, you know, revolutionary tech here. We're talking about a company that delivers food. And its valuation went from nothing when it was founded in 2013 to just over $12.5 billion as of its last valuation. So there's this nutty stuff going on in the private markets, which, by the way, is unwinding. We all know that, you know, these stocks started to crash. The smaller second and third tier companies started to crash last year. Now you're seeing it hit the uh, bigger names, the Ubers and Lyfts that go down every day. So this is starting to be unwound. But it's out there. Now, I mentioned that household net worth is kind of one of these broadest categories that looks at the value of assets, all the, the homes we own, the stocks we own, other assets, and then look at it as a ratio relative to GDP. So basically, what is the asset economy doing in terms of how it's, what the real economy is doing? And we've seen over the last couple of cycles, assets have gotten relatively more, more and more overvalued versus the real economy at levels we've never be seen before in the history of the U.S., at the peak of the dot-com bubble, household net worth was about 4.4 times uh, the underlying economic GDP at the time. Then after the market crashed and assets came down, we had the housing bubble. At the peak of the housing bubble, household net worth was about 4.8 times underlying GDP. And then the housing market crashed, right? In this run-up, given the magnitude and length and so on, I kind of, you know, I've used, and so have other people used this sort of tongue-in-cheek term, everything bubble, because it involves a lot of different assets. Uh, we're roughly 5.2 times underlying GDP as of the third quarter of last year, which, again, is something we've never seen before. So it gives you an idea of, you know, assets out there relative to what, what the real economy is doing. It's pretty much unprecedented, or is unprecedented. And this is a funny example that I just kind of throw out there just because I think it illustrates what's going on in esoteric assets. You know, stocks, bonds, we all follow. Our, the value of our homes, we follow that. But not as many people follow art and, and you know, some of these other esoteric assets. But this was, this was really funny when it happened. Um, the art markets had really its own bubble or boom or whatever you want to call it. You may have heard of the UK artist Banksy. Um, he had this, this work auctioned off called Girl with Balloon. It was auctioned off at Sotheby's um, in the UK in October of 2018. Now, beforehand, all the, you know, people were kind of trying to guess how much is it going to go for, right? And they were looking at somewhere between 260 and 400,000 U.S. Um, but it actually sold for more than triple that, $1.4 million when it was gaveled down. Um, but more remarkable than the price paid was that right after that happened, uh, Banksy apparently had sort of an operative in the, in, the, uh, in the room, and they somehow pressed a remote control, and all of a sudden the painting began to shred itself. There was a shredder built into the frame. Uh, and people were stunned, like, what's going on? You know, this, this, somebody just paid a million four for something that's now, you know, in tatters. But the funny thing is, after a couple of days, people talked about it and said, oh, this is such a unique thing that's never happened before in the art market. This thing's actually worth more as garbage than it was as a complete work. So it kind of just illustrates some of the, the manic behavior you're seeing in many other asset markets, uh, where you're not seeing that in gold and silver and so on. Certainly at not, not at this stage in the game. So again, that's kind of, you know, it's a funny example, but it sort of proves the point. And what I think here, if you want to look at sort of just more of a mathematical or analytical type image, this is a chart I put together at the end of May, and it just looks, compares gold, the price of gold, to the S&P 500 as a ratio. And you can see that, you know, here's where gold ran up. Gold was doing much better than stocks. This ratio got very extended. And obviously, that was kind of the end of the gold, boom, that phase of the gold bull market in 2011. Uh, then this came down. Nobody wanted anything to do with gold. They wanted to buy stocks. And you saw this ratio get more and more stretched. To the point that as of May, I was like, gosh, you know, we're back to this level that sort of started the last gold bull market. And, you know, what happened, right? That was May 31st. That was almost the day, uh, and it's just coincidence, happy coincidence anyway, that uh, gold started soaring again. And since, you know, noticing, hey, this is really cheap, uh, you know, maybe gold's a good buy, it's up $290 an ounce, give or take, from that level. So it just shows that, you know, cheap valuation is not a fantastic timing tool, but it does tell you which assets might have a lot more potential than others. This is just another way of looking at it. We're looking at the Huey index, which is the gold, Amex Gold Bugs index versus the S&P. So basically, how are gold stocks performing relative to stocks as opposed to gold, the metal itself? 
you can see this ratio, I mean, it's been sort of the, the high point for paper assets in, the, in this, these last couple of cycles. So gold, got, gold stocks got less and less uh, or more and more undervalued relative to the market a couple of times. And that was a good time to buy gold stocks. Again, it kind of was coincident with the last two peaks of the economic cycle and the market cycle. But relative to that, I mean, you can see that gold stocks, comparatively speaking to the S&P 500, have gotten ridiculously cheap at the time I did this. And again, what happened, it, yeah, I put this together on May 30th, and then since then we've seen gold stocks and silver, silver stocks soar. So I think that, that it just shows you, again, it's cheapness, relative cheapness. Um, lastly, we're talking about concrete supply and demand. Forget you know, what's going on in the economy, forget what's going on uh, in terms of interest rates and so on. What are the actual supply, demand fundamentals of the precious metals market, and how do they look? Well, there the news is good as well. You're seeing trends improve. Uh, the World Gold Council tracks this stuff on a quarterly basis, kind of what's going on, not just here in the U.S., but overseas as well. And overall gold demand, their measure of overall gold demand was up about 8% year over year to 1,123 tons in the second quarter. It wasn't coming from jewelry, right? That market was relatively tepid. Demand was up about 2%. You saw investment flows in ETFs basically double, the amount of, of, of ETF inflows doubling. And most importantly, the big guys, basically, the central banks are active buyers again of, of gold as a you know, reserve asset. Um, central bank buying was up by about 47% year over year. Um, so again, you, know, you look at the ETF demand, obviously investors are starting to notice what's going on. That was 67.2 uh, tons. People are buying protection against what's going on in the interest rate market, trade war fears, volatility, and all of that. But mostly to me, the biggest story is reserve buying. Um, net purchases of 374 uh, you know, basically that, that, that tonnage measurement there in the first half of 2019 was the highest in any first half since 2010. And it's not just happening in one or two central banks driving this. You're seeing, you know, obviously there's a few whales in this market, what's happening in China and so on. Um, but you're also seeing Russia and you're seeing nine different central banks that by the World Gold Council's research were doing noticeable accumulation of gold in the second quarter. Um, you may have heard of Russia in particular, even earlier in the second quarter of this year. They basically sold, I think it was about $85 billion of U.S. treasuries and bought an equivalent dollar amount of gold. They de-dollarized, is sort of the jargony term, term for it. But it shows that especially economies and countries that we're not as friendly with are trying to lessen their, uh, their sort of tethering to the U.S. dollar and they're buying gold. This just graphically shows you, again, first half buying here uh, relative to the last couple of years it's up. And again, sort of the last time a lot of this was going on was in 2013 and the level of buying is even higher than that. And like I mentioned, you can tell if you look at where this is happening, it's mostly or the biggest buying is coming from countries that we're less friendly with these days. Um, this chart shows sort of net purchases by central banks geographically. What do you see? Russian Federation, mainland China, Turkey, obviously we know we're not getting along very well. So you have emerging market countries that are buying more gold and countries that want to sort of get at some money out of the dollar, out of U.S. assets and into something that they think will, will hold up if geopolitical concerns continue to grow. And this, again, this graphically just shows you as a, um, the ETF flows alone. Again, not central banks, but ETF flows. You can see that relative to what had been going on, there was a lot of very active buying in June, came down a little bit in July, back up again in August. Essentially, if you look at ETF flows year to date through September, um, they're up 13.4% to an all-time high. So again, money is flowing back into this market, uh, and the numbers are pretty big, which is helping to drive prices. Ray Dalio, you may have heard uh, the name before. He's the billionaire hedge fund uh, chief investment officer of Bridgewater Associates. And he wrote this really long kind of think piece. This guy throws these things out there sometimes. And this was a couple months ago, um, July actually. And he wrote, you know, I slogged through the whole thing. It's got a lot of, uh, a lot of jargon, a lot of difficult, hard to sort of, uh, sort of make your way through stuff in there. But what was really neat and sort of in his, you know, I'm astute language use, uh, very subdued, was he asked a, a rhetorical question. Which investments will perform well in a reflationary environment accompanied by large liabilities coming due and with significant internal conflict between capitalists and socialists as well as external conflicts? What will be the next best currency or storehold of wealth to have when most reserve currency central bankers want to devalue their currencies in a fiat currency system? In English, what's going to be the thing that everybody's going to want to buy to protect themselves against currency devaluation, geopolitical problems, and sort of the increasing you know, left and right problems we're having even here in the US? And it's gold. I mean, that's his answer. And I think that's also a very reasonable answer for myself and for investors here. Um, this is a simple gold weekly chart, kind of looks at where we've come over the last several years. Obviously, we know we had the big blow-off high up around 1,900 an ounce. 
in a long period where gold just kind of wandered in the wilderness. It wasn't doing anything, really. It was just sort of sitting there. And I'll be honest, I'm not a traditional gold bug by nature. There's times I like gold, there's times I don't like it, and there's times I don't really care what it's doing. There's better opportunities elsewhere. And we had a situation like that for a long time in gold. However, it, you can also see it's a nice rounded bottom that took about six years to carve out. Series of higher lows, this level was capping us for a long time, but then we broke out of it, and we broke out of it with vigor and persistence earlier this year. So I think that that, you know, technically speaking, again, if I didn't even know what I was looking at here in this chart, I would say this looks really good. It has a huge, very long-term base that it's now coming out of. Um, I think gold's got hundreds of dollars of upside over the next couple of years. So how can you profit? Um, you know, some investors, depending on the size of your portfolio, I think smaller investors, there's nothing wrong with just buying the Spider Gold shares, GLD. Uh, it's an easy way to own or invest in bullion, you know, indirectly. The expense ratio is pretty low at about 0.4%. And there's $44 billion in assets in this ETF, so it's a good place to get started. Um, I think the larger your, your sort of dollar allocation is to precious metals, the more you want to have a physical element and actual ownership of bullion or coins and so on versus just paper gold, for lack of a better term. But I think it's a good starting point. Um, within the sector, obviously, miners have more leverage to upside. The, you know, if gold goes up 10%, the miners are leveraged to it. They're going to go up by some multiple of that, not just 10%. Wheat and precious metals is one of my favorites in the sector because it actually offers a little bit of dividend protection. It's not fantastic. Um, the yield's only about 1.3%. But this is one of these companies that's a streaming company. If you're not familiar with the term, they basically partner with and help finance miners um, as opposed to open mines themselves. And they get a cent, they get royalty off of production, off of the income those mines generate. And they've got partnerships with about 17 different miners, exposure to 28 different operating and development stage processes. So the good thing about a streaming company is, again, if one mine has some problems, it's in a, it's in a country that's unstable and the government decides to you know, appropriate your assets, or you have labor issues, or you know, your early drilling results don't pan out, um, and that, you know, that project can go bust, uh, they're diversified, so they have, you know, they finance multiple projects in multiple places. Um, I like the management there. I was able to listen to them up in Vancouver this summer, and I was pretty impressed with what I heard at a different conference, so that's a name I like. Uh, Sandstorm Gold is another one that's a little riskier. If you have a little more appetite for risk, ticker symbol is S-A-N-D. And just so you know, these, the ratings are, are Weiss ratings for these companies. Um, because gold has had issues for a while, our purely, you know, sort of quantitative ratings model has these guys in hold range. But as they're coming out of it, even the model is going to be picking up on some of the improvement, and I'm trying to get ahead of that because I think that's what we're going to see next. Uh, Sandstorm Gold, again, it's another one of these gold streaming and royalty companies. Uh, they have exposure to a much wider range of projects, 145. Uh, a lot of them are in North and South America. Some are, a few of them are in less geopolitically stable regions. But again, that's a company that has more risk but more potential return. Uh, they are focused on growth. They're not, um, they, they have been buying back stock as opposed to doing a dividend. Um, but the potential in the future down the road is there if you know, I'm right about what's going to happen to gold and silver prices. Now, one other thing in addition, addition to the names that like, I've added my own fundamental research to, I basically am able, with the Weiss ratings model, I and mean, we rate every single stock, every ETF, every mutual fund that trades in the U.S. and Canada every single trading day. Uh, we run the model against it. It's enormous amounts of data. Um, and what I can do is I can go in there and say, okay, give me just the you know, companies in this sector, right, or as opposed to the app market overall and so on. So what I did is I, I had our, number, our, our uh, model basically pull just for gold and silver miners, zero down to just that group, and find out which ones are rated the absolute highest by the model. So again, no additional fundamental analysis, just some other names that are worth maybe looking into. The model's picking up on fundamental and technical strength. And these are the names that resulted from that poll from a few days ago. Uh, Kirkland Lake is one. It trades in Canada and on the New York Stock Exchange. West Dome Gold Mines is another one. Um, and Centera, you can see from the tickers that some of these are, are traded, uh, you know, they're five-letter they're five letter tickers. They're not on the New York Stock Exchange. They're on the over-the-counter market. Uh, Royal Gold is another streamer that came up in that name as well. Stock's done very well. You can see, I mean, year-to-day returns are, are great for this sector. Um, but the question is, can, where, you know, is there still more gas in the tank? My view is yes over time. I mean, I, to me, this is a multi-year bull market that's setting up, considering especially that that period of consolidation took a very, very long time. So with that, um, that's how, again, uh, you know, tomorrow at the bullpen at 145, I'll be talking about more of a top-down view on not just gold, but what else is going on in the stock market and, and things like that. Um, but here, I wanted to focus, because I think gold and, and precious metals companies are among the most attractive uh, investments out there. If you want more information, ongoing picks, 
Um, like I said, I put those flyers out there that the Safe Money Reports, our flagship newsletter, we've been publishing it in one form or another since the late 1970s as a company. Um, so that's a good place to get started. It doesn't just have gold companies in there. It does also cover other markets and other stocks and so on. Um, my colleague, Sean Broderick, who actually was just at the Toronto conference, he's not here at this one, um, he runs another, uh, another service called Supercycle Investor. It's more aggressive. It's more frequent trading. It's based on, you know, he's looking at some really risky junior, you know, high risk, high potential reward junior miners and things like that um, that I just wouldn't put in the Safe Money newsletter. That's another thing that, that is maybe worth looking into if you're interested. We do have the Money Show Dallas rates that are put on the, on the board there, $78 a year for SMR. Um, that run, is good for the show and in the aftermath if you call up and, uh, you know, just tell the customer service people that you want to subscribe. There's a code in there that you can use online as well. And if you're not quite ready, if it's your first time dealing with Weiss Ratings or listening to me, um, you can sign up for the Weiss Ratings briefing at the website, www.weissratings.com. It's just a three times per week in the morning news, uh, email newsletter. It's completely free, and it just sort of catches you up on our worldview. Each of us in the rotation specializes on a different asset class. I happen to be focused on interest rates and metals. Sean is into things like junior miners and so on. Again, you can get signed up. You can follow our work for a little while, see if you're comfortable with what it is we do, and get signed up. And then also, um, if you happen to use Twitter at all, that's sort of the social media platform I use for uh, financial and market-related observations. I'm on Twitter, at RealMikeLarson. Uh, feel free to follow me, and I'll comment on what I see going on on a day-to-day, shorter-term basis. Whew. All right, I tried to talk quick, but not too quick, so I could leave a little bit of time for questions at the end, and we have about seven or eight minutes. So um, with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Yes, sir. You know, my colleague Sean that I was mentioning, he's a little, he's more of a silver guy than I am in terms of risk reward. He does, you know, the thing that concerns me a little more about silver is, again, the industrial kind of exposure to it. Um, and, you know, in, in the case of platinum, for example, looking at some of the, you know, what it's going to mean for the industrial applications for that as well. Gold to me, yes, it's stretched relative to other metals, but it's all, I mean, it's not a hundred percent pure precious play, but it's more so, I think. And I think that in this market, Things like what's going on in the interest rate markets, the economy, and so on. Um, you know, if the econ let's say let's say I'm right. Let's say we're in a recession next year. And if you look at global growth figures, for example, uh, you know, even today on Bloomberg, there was a uh, story saying, you know, is the world economy heading for recession in you know 2020? Um, I think that you're going to have some some performance drag, or you know, you have some impact on markets that have an industrial component too, versus pure precious metals. So I don't dislike those other ones, but I guess if I you know if I could only buy one, I would probably stick with gold. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I have no problem with owning an ETF on the sector, especially if you're just, you know, if you're just starting, if let's say you don't have a huge amount of money and you want some gold exposure, you don't want to do the extra work or the, pardon the pun, digging into individual miners. I don't have a problem with it. I mean, if you look at GDX's performance relative to the S&P, it's up something like, you know, four times the S&P in the last year. Uh, and I think that that outperformance is appropriate and likely to continue for this point in the cycle. Um, because maybe I'm partial because I work for a company that also rates individual equities as opposed to just the ETFs. I think that with a little bit of work, with a little additional research, you can find individual names that have more promise. But do I think there's anything fundamentally wrong with buying an ETF? No. I mean, I think GD GDX is fine in terms of versus competitors. You know, again, a lot, a large percentage, I mean, I couldn't give you the exact number off the top of my head, a large chunk of that money was basically, you know, given back to shareholders or used for things like stock buybacks, dividend hikes, you know, which there's nothing inherently wrong with that. I mean, you know, companies rewarding shareholders, that's sort of the point. But the problem is there wasn't also a coincident huge boom in, pract uh, you know, practical real-world investment, R&D, you know, uh, investment in factories, investment in real estate, things like that. It didn't really, you know, a lot of the money was sort of shunted away. So, you know, when you're not using extra money to build a factory, which then generates earnings and revenue growth down the road, and you're just giving it to present-day shareholders, it's kind of, it doesn't do as much for the real economy. And so I think we're running out. And I, so 
regardless of, of that point, the other important point is that we're kind of at the tail end of that impact. The, the extra boost the economy even partially got from that and the extra boost the stock market got from that is probably running out at this point. So I think it, it's one of the, the, the end of that extra turbocharging or stimulus or whatever you want to call it is the fact that that's ending is one reason why I think the economy is at high risk of recession next year. Yeah, I mean, th again, the, the whole point that I think is important when it comes to, oh, well, the Fed or the, or the fiscal, you know, Uncle Sam can come and save us from a, a downturn. The problem is we didn't rebuild Uncle Sam's balance sheet during this expansion. Um, you know, we continued to run hundreds of billions and in some cases over a trillion dollar in deficits even during the good times. So whereas heading into the, the Great Recession, we had, you know, we had a much better sort of uh, government balance sheet to fight that and to do all these things, all the, throwing all the money. I mean, you know, whatever you think of TARP, whether it's a boondog or it was a smart thing that helped save the economy, the fact is the money was there, it was easier to borrow and help finance that uh, versus now if we, woke, if we were in a similar great financial crisis like we had, you know, in the end of 2000 or 2000s, where's the money going to come from? It's not there. I mean, we're, we are, we're heading into an economic cycle downturn uh, without the ammunition and that's, that's true of interest rates and it's true also of government balance sheet capacity. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, do you sell other things like your your stocks, or do you sell gold as it goes up, or buy? You know, you certainly. Again, like I said, I'm not a traditional gold bug. There's time, you know. I so I don't have any extra sort of. You know, all we you always have to own gold versus you don't. I mean, it just happens to be that my fundamental view on gold aligns with the need for insurance and profit potential that I think all the factors have come together that um, I would be buying more on pullbacks because I think this bull market's probably got a couple more years to run. Um, you know, I would use every correction at this point and really especially since that breakout to accumulate. Uh, you know, at some point, are these funda fundamental factors going to turn? Sure. You know, uh, like I said, I don't think you should own gold forever. There's, you know, there's times you want to be an aggressive seller and times you want to be an aggressive buyer. I think we're really in sort of the latter scenario now. So um, I think, yeah, I mean, you know, I think I should probably, at the risk of not contradicting myself too much, I think there's always a, po a place for a small amount of gold, whatever, it's 5% or something like that. Um, but, you know, these are times where, in my opinion, something more like 20% or maybe, depending on what else you own, even higher percentage in gold makes a lot of sense versus let's assume 5% is what, any person should always have. I mean, this is more of a 20, maybe even 25 percent kind of market to me, anyway. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Appreciate you coming here, and uh, I will be here for a few minutes before the next person comes in. If you have any private one-on-one -on -one questions you want to ask, so thank you.